please welcome Adam Savage. Hi, everybody. So, uh, what's been going on? Hi. It is lovely to be here. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming out, for braving a con. I know it's been a weird time, and we're going to talk about some of that, but, like, you are here, I am here. Let's have a fun, like, most of an hour together. Okay. I, uh... Yeah, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about what my COVID was like. Because uh, we've all, like, been through the meat grinder. Uh, and, you know, COVID started and the tested folks, we called each other up and we're like, well, we, we can't get together. So what are we going to do? And Norm was like, I'm going to set up a camera with a microphone for you in the shop on a tripod and you can film yourself. And I went in and I looked at that camera and that tripod with the microphone and I was like, no, I can't do that. Like, it's just too much, I, like, I know how to use a video camera, but to like, use one competently, it's more than just knowing how to push the red button. And then I thought, you know, maybe I'll just use this instead. And lo, that worked. We've, we ran the site for 14 months on an iPhone. Yeah, I know. Actually, Apple found out and sent us one. So like, freebies from Apple just don't happen. In fact, it's probably wrong that I'm telling you about it. Um, and then I started making, you know, we were going from, I was making about four videos a month to seven a week. Uh, and it was amazing. And frankly, if, you know, the response from the fans was one of the most amazing things because we were all going through it together, like just figuring it out. And that was really lovely. Um, until the summer of 2020 when I've been lucky enough in my life up till now. I lost my father in 98 but I have not lost any close friends, and we lost Grant Imahara last summer. Yeah. Um, and what you don't know is that a week before Grant passed, I also lost John Tessier, who was the producer of Mythbusters Jr. and Savage Builds. He was my showrunner and my compadre, and I had never lost a friend that close. And then Grant died, and then another friend died. I lost three friends inside of a month. Um, I would like this moment, because I know that all of you have gone through some significant ex existential crises over the last 18 months. I'd like just to take a moment for us to reflect on that, and I'd like to begin at that. So let's just take a, a quiet moment. Thank you. And now here we are, mostly back. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> um, I, I must say, it has been really lovely talking to you all today, signing autographs, taking pictures. I, I don't know about you, but I've been finding every waiter and waitress I have in the last couple months is telling me their whole life story. Everyone's dying to talk. Every Uber driver, everybody's just telling me everything. And I think it's great. We need, we need that connection. Um, I also really appreciate uh, uh, the people out in costume. I, can we have a round of applause for everyone in costume today? So, last year was supposed to be my con year, and then that happened. And so this year, it's like I'm taking care, I'm doing, I think, eight cons in 10 weeks. Yeah, so <laughs> thanks for the gasp. Um, so I am not cosplaying until a little later this year. There's just too much infrastructure to travel and move and get all that stuff going. Um, and now, yeah, here we are. Uh, so I would love to just start by talking to you guys. We have microphones in the aisles over here and here. And if you want to line up and ask me a question, I'm dying to hear what's on your mind, what you've been going through, and uh, what questions you might have. Um, also, while you guys are lining up, I will tell you, I had the most incredible fantasy camp pair of days yesterday and the day before uh, at the Smithsonian and the, uh, the Udvarhazi, uh, yeah. Yeah, I know you saw some pictures. I have to say, you know, I know that I, I put up on Instagram last week a picture of me at Galaxy's Edge in Orlando. And yesterday we were putting up some pictures of me and Udvar Hazi, and it's, it's a toss-up for me, which is more exciting, to be honest. 
being around the real stuff is just, just nothing quite equates to it. Um, yes, sir. Uh, hi. Oh, that's very loud. <laughs> uh, my name is Luke. Uh, I'm a teacher from Pennsylvania. And uh, no. That is a hard job. I don't, I don't know what happened, but like in the past 20 years, I guess people have started treating teachers like veterans. Like you tell them like, hey, I'm a teacher. And they're like, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> like, thank you for your service. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> You're welcome, I guess. Um, Soon they'll so, have fatigues for teachers. Right, I'd wear it. Um, uh, probably easier to clean. Um, so my question, and I apologize if this is a niche question, um, but uh, <laughs> look where you are. Yeah. <laughs> you are in the land of niche questions. <laughs> One of my favorite things uh, to come out of the past couple of years watching all of your stuff was your just genuine childlike wonder and glee at watching the creations of a young man named Barnaby Dixon. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and I told you it was niche. Nobody here. Uh, no, so for the reference, <laughs> Barnaby makes these beautiful little puppets that utilize his fingers in a way that is really unique and novel. And uh, it, it goes to show you that puppeteering is so much more than Muppets. In fact, uh, 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 in fact Henson was upset at the level of fame his puppets got. And so, in the, what I understand, in the 70s in New York, he started a puppet convention just so that people could learn that there were more puppets than Muppets. <laughs> and Barnaby Dixon's amazing construction, seriously, search Barnaby Dixon on, on, the, on the YouTube, and it's like his stuff is really inspiring. Sorry, but you had a question. Well, yeah, my question is, is there any opportunity or plans to ever get back to seeing his work uh, again? Oh I yeah, <laughs> no, we'll, we'll let people back in the cave at some point soon. <laughs> um, it is one of the great graces of, make, of doing Tested is that we get to reach out to people doing awesome stuff and say, come on and show us. Um, and we're just as thrilled as they are when they come into our space. It's often people are like, really? You guys are all paying attention? And it's really true, we are. Um, so Barnaby's work is incredible, his enthusiasm is lovely, and the innovation, again, it's like right up the middle of our wheelhouse on Tested. So I think absolutely we'll bring him back. That would be awesome, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, man, <laughs> and thank you for your service. <laughs> yes. Hello, uh, Benjamin from Washington, D.C. Um, with the Mythbusters auction um, about to go live on Prop Store th just after this weekend, I was, uh, proceeds to benefit the Grant Imahara Steam Foundation, I believe. Well done. Um, <laughs> is there any props on the auction that have any special memories for you or anything you'd like to share stories behind them? You've been watching my YouTube output for the last couple of weeks? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Every single one. I mean, yeah, there's... Uh, you look, every single prop also carries with it this like, oh, that day sucked. <laughs> because some of them did. Um, I will tell you that RoboShark, which is my favorite, RoboShark and the evil monkey's paw cat that Grant built, <laughs> those are my two favorite props in the, in the auction. And RoboShark, I mean, RoboShark was amazing. He was my idea. And my producer was like, where are we gonna get a giant fiberglass shark? And I'm like, I found one for $3,000. <laughs> He's like, where is it? I'm like, it's in Florida. Now, I didn't realize that it was not just in Florida. It was like way out in the Everglades, like in 1978. <laughs> because there wasn't even a phone at the shop they were making the shark. You had to call some office and someone drove out to the shop to talk to the guys laying down the fiberglass for these 17-foot sharks. And they said a delivery time of like two months. We gave them four and we barely got it in time. I mean, it was just a so touch and go. But when we got this thing, Jamie and I split it into the sections. And yeah, I remember that being a really stunning week because there's a, one of the things I like to point out is when you get good at making, you start doing a lot of the making in your head. You start doing a lot of the problem solving and iteration in your head. And so I spend usually on a big build, like a month before I even start making a drawing. I'm just like picturing this thing in my head and I'm sort of thinking about, I'm looking up what other people have done. Uh, and that shark, we had all of this time to picture how we were going to slice and dice it, and it all worked really great. So when it finally arrived, we had that shark built in a week. And I'm really <laughs> proud of that. I love that thing. I mean, it's a great amusement park ride for anyone who wants to crawl into the mouth of a shark and get thrashed around, <laughs> which surprisingly not many people do. E <laughs> Even Tori was like, man, I got mixed feelings about getting in that thing. I'm like, are you kidding? I would pay to do this. 
<laughs> anyway, thank you so much for that question. Yes, Prop Store is auctioning off Mythbusters original props, including blueprints. You can get original blueprints drawn by me, Jamie, Cary Grant, and Tori, uh, and they're being auctioned off to benefit the Grant Imahara Steam Foundation. Um, go there, go often, buy some stuff, it'll be amazing. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Mickey Cohn from Pennsylvania. Hey, uh, Mickey. Wow, that's real loud. Uh, <laughs> I'm cosplaying today, and you were really one of my big inspirations for doing Oh, cosplay. Fifth Element a bit. <laughs> Nicely done. <laughs> Thank you. So I was actually curious. I know you've probably talked about it before, but what is what got you into doing cosplay? Um, being a lonely kid. <laughs> Seriously, being a lonely kid. I, I will tell you a story from therapy. <laughs> because every, I feel like my whole life is me like waking up and being like, I can't believe I didn't notice that whole thing that was going on. That's what life feels like. But every six months, I'm like, what? And I was in therapy a few weeks ago. And as can happen, Zoom was totally like being a nightmare. You know, it's like all of a sudden Zoom's like, I don't know who you are. I don't know what a computer is. And I'm like trying to dial in and the links are all different and everything's not working and now I'm getting kind of pissed off. And so I finally arrive in therapy and I'm like, well, now you get to see me in a super activated state. <laughs> and my therapist goes, yeah, I see that. Maybe there's a jacket that would feel good for you to put on. And I was like, holy shit. <laughs> because there was. And so I went, I was like, give me a second. And I went in the back and I came back out in my fireman's turnout coat. And this is a morning pride. The fire, makers of fireman's turnout gear gave Jamie and I a full setup of fireman's turnout gear. Beautiful, brand new. We wore it for everything on Mythbusters. That thing has, is stained with every explosive I ever touched on Mythbusters. <laughs> And also, fireman's turnout gear is amazing in that it keeps you hot when it's cold and it lets you be cool when it's way hot. It's an impressive thing. Um, and it does feel like a security, security blanket to me. And I put it on and then I was thinking, wow, maybe, maybe there's a reason that I've spent my whole life making armor. <laughs> <laughs> because I like the protection. And I, literally felt like, you know how in like Bugs Bunny when they have that super obvious thought and their face turns into a jackass? That's like what I felt was happening now. I'm like, I can't believe you didn't already know this about yourself, that you crave protection. And so my first, my first cosplay was a spacesuit. I took a five gallon cardboard Baskin Robbins cardboard tub, cut a hole out of it and put a piece of clear plastic and made it a space helmet. And I've made you know, 15 spacesuits since then, half a dozen suits of armor, uh, all the safety equipment on Mythbusters. All of it stems from the same place. It stems from the love of putting on this new hermit crab shell of protection. Uh, and frankly, it's a, a deeply human thing. Our nakedness, well, I mean, I know that most of you have seen my TED, my TED talk, but yeah, our nakedness, our hairlessness, is what allows humans to attenuate our thermal conditions with clothing. And it's what, for better or worse, what makes us the most successful species on Earth. Wow, really, mostly for worse at this point. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I love that protection. I love that we can engineer our own, our own, I mean, one of the descriptions of a spacesuit is it is in an anthropomorphic spaceship. Yeah. Right? <laughs> like, that definition alone just makes me so happy. Um, and that's the longest way of saying that all of the stuff that we do with this cosplay and the creative things that, I mean, it's what I love about coming here is because everyone's letting their freak flag fly. And that's like where we find the sweet spot, but we also find ourselves. That's where I, like, I have found myself repeatedly through cosplay. And when I gave that TED talk, I didn't know most of the stuff I said in that talk until I was writing it out and I had to define what I meant and I had to examine my experience. And that also, that also jibes with every other creative endeavor I've ever done, is it's a journey of self-discovery. You learn about yourself, you confront yourself at the workbench, you do something, you cut yourself, you get angry, you walk away, you come back. That is a little iteration of what life is gonna be like for the rest of it. And that process of self-discovery keeps feeding me, so I'm gonna keep diving into it. Thank you for that great question. Thank you so much. Hi. 
I'm Rebecca, and this is my son, Brody. Hi, Brody. He has a question. I don't know if we can lean this over, but we'll try. What was your favorite Mythbuster episode? My favorite Mythbuster episode. It is so impossible to pick. We made almost 300 of them. Top yeah, three. I know. I get tired just thinking about it now. I was in my 30s when we started making that show. Oh, wow. Um, I heard someone say, wow. Maybe that was a little too loud. Um, however, what stands out in my head on Mythbusters are key moments in which I got to do something impossible, like fly a concrete airplane or hand feed an octopus that fell in love with me and left hickeys all the way up to my shoulder. Seriously, my wife was like, what is that? Um, Flying with the Blue Angels, uh, breaking the sound barrier, vomiting constantly. I pulled seven and a half G's and I did not pass out. Thank you. To be fair, I pulled seven and a half G's and passed out, but I also didn't pass out. I did it twice. Um, and when I was seven and a half G's, by the way, I weighed 1,500 pounds. Yeah, no, I could barely lift my head. Oh, and I noticed in the camera that my face looked just like my dad's. <laughs> that was creepy. Um, but the great grace of doing that show, to be honest, the thing that is the most surprising and the most unexpected, because look, it was, a, it was a passion, but it was also a job. And every job you will ever have, young man, is going to both suck and or be awesome. Because... There is no like job that's fun all the time. In fact, what I do now is crazy fun and still like 70% of it is drudgery. 70% of it is repetitive and tedious and that's the point and that's how we go through this stuff. Um, but that I, seriously, and this sounds like audience pandering, so I apologize if it does, but it's genuinely true. The great grace of doing Mythbusters is that I get to sit at a, at a table today and hear people tell me what, how it inspired them to get into science. That is, all of us as who worked on that show are like... Because I guarantee you we were not thinking about the children. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brody. That was a great question. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, um, <laughs> I'm Brian. I live down in Manassas. Um, I'm just curious with your pivot. First, it's kind of a two-parter. Like, what, what encouraged you to do the pivot? And secondarily, what is your most current pipe dream after Mythbusters? Like, <laughs> you, mean, what, you mean my reverse pain, fame pivot from television star to YouTuber? <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. I mean it's, it's being of a slightly old, I mean, you know, shifting yeah. changes. But then I'm also curious, like, at your current point, what is your current pipe dream? What's your current, what are you, like, reaching for that you are haven't gotten to yet. Oh, there's such a long list. I, I um, should probably use the term moon sh uh, moonshot. Yeah, uh, so the pivot is interesting because I don't, I mean, obviously I see from the outside that it looks like a pivot. From the inside, everything is just a decision I'm making that day to get through that day and to work with the people that I love and to try and get something out of it, make something of it. Um, the most shocking thing about COVID was that it turned out our, our YouTube channel was COVID proof. Our whole team worked full time the whole through the whole thing, and we we're able to keep them all employed and benefits and everything. And I'm so grateful for that. I didn't expect that was a viable model. I really didn't. I thought, wow, this is going to be a weird year, and then it turned out to be, in some ways, an incredible. I mean, you, anyone who was watching me on YouTube, I started chasing those zeros on the machine tools, and I found a whole universe to explore. Um, but I began my real adult careers, <laughs> plural, um, as a freelancer. And when you are freelance, it doesn't matter how much dough someone is paying you this month, your brain is like, yeah, but what about next month? And it is what's next, what's next, what's next, what's next? And not only that, it is what other industries might need my skills. So like I started out in model making for theater and that led to commercial model making and film. And then that led to toy prototyping, which during Toy Fair in New York is a super lucrative thing to be able to do. Um, but still lucrative for February, not necessarily for March. Um, 
So even when Jamie and I were making Mythbusters, both of us as freelancers were like, yeah, but what's next? Like, when this all tanks, what the hell are we gonna do? And that is like, when this all tanks, what the hell am I gonna do? Ought to be a t-shirt that I wear all the time. <laughs> um, and it's a, lovely, it's, a, it's a lovely consciousness to have. And it's also one that's like, you love it or you don't, right? Like I totally understand wanting a secure place to not have to think about work. Like that is a totally reasonable choice to make. I, I choose another one because I have a different, uh, you know, a different bent, but like, I totally get that. What was your question? <laughs> right, the pivot. <laughs> So Moonshots right now, we have a big build that we're going to reveal later on this year that I just spent a month doing. It is so beautiful. I cannot wait to show it to y'all. Um, and it is definitely emblematic of the kind of bigger swings that I would like to do with Tested. Working with sponsors, working with outside folks who want to do something big together and trying something that takes a month instead of two days. Because I frankly just a tiny bit burned out on one day builds. And I don't mean one day builds as a category, I mean builds that take one day. Like I find myself wanting, I keep looking around. It's like I, I'm working on a Mandalorian costume okay. and I've reached out to, yeah, totally. <laughs> the Beskar costume, cause I love the swagger he has in that armor. Um, and I've been commissioning and purchasing stuff from great makers of Mandalorian stuff. Almost the whole suit is commissioned. Mm. But even still, it'll take me like a full week to get that thing tuned to my body and weathered correctly. And like, that's the kind of thing I'm looking forward to doing, spending more time on each of these builds and turning it into larger chunks of content. Thank you. Hello. Um, Hello. My name is Nikita. I'm a student from the University of Richmond. And as I'm becoming a student, I have a lot of life decisions to make. <laughs> So as you just said, you've explored a lot of career paths for your journey. And as you said, you were a toy designer and then you ended up as a television person and everything. How do you have the courage to try something new and not be afraid to abandon something? That's a wonderful question. Um, a huge part of that is owed to my parents. My parents gave me a tremendous and gigantic privilege in that when I didn't want to work at a job that was not good, and by not good, I usually mean the people there didn't like their work and thus the place was a bit toxic. My parents covered my rent for a couple months while I found another job. That's huge. I'm frankly not sure I would do that with my own kids. <laughs> I would, but like the privilege that gave me to kind of step back because what they were doing was they were prioritizing for me the way I wanted work to feel. And that's a tremendous luxury. So when people ask me about future jobs and things that they might do for a career, I always like to say, imagine how the job feels to work at. Do you want to work with people who inspire you? Think about what that feels like when they do. Do you want to work with people who challenge you and push you farther? Think about what that feels like. And if you spend time thinking about what that feels like, when it actually shows up, you'll recognize it. And that thought process of like, and look, even if you're in a crappy job that you can't get out of, which is totally a real circumstance, you can spend time in that job thinking, what doesn't work here? And how would I like it to work elsewhere? And again, just that iterative process of thinking through what that's gonna be like will help you recognize the cool thing when it shows up. And it may just be that there's like one cool dude at work and you really dig him. And you start thinking, what is it about that guy that is so, makes me feel, oh, he makes me feel good for this reason and he tends to support me and he listens and da da da. And when you meet another person that does that, you'll be like, come here, you're my best friend. <laughs> Seriously, I, I, there is courage to it, to be sure. And I have definitely had moments when I've had to convince yeah, in, uh, in uh, uh, spring of 1999, my sons were born, my twin boys, and uh, I was working on Bicentennial Man, which was a terrible movie to work. I loved the movie, the job itself wasn't great. And I wasn't happy about working on the job and I wanted to go up to ILM and work on episode two Star Wars and I knew they were gearing up. But there's a union rule in San Francisco that you can't just skip from one union job to another. Union don't like that. So I had to quit Bicentennial Man. I had five-month-old twins, and 
I said to my wife, I want to quit this job. And she was like, I trust you, baby. And I was like, really? <laughs> okay. Um, and then Jamie called me and offered me a year of work on Monkey Bone. Oh. And I wanted to work on that. There's a whole bunch of my friends were working on it. And Henry Selleck was directing it. I, they, he did Night Before Christmas. Uh, but I also remembered what it was like to work with Jamie as his employee, and I didn't want to do that anymore. <laughs> so then I told my wife, I know I just quit this Bicentennial Man job, but I've gotten offered a year and a half of work, and I'm going to turn that down too. <laughs> and she was like, I trust you, baby. <laughs> And then I went up to ILM, jobless, but because I was free, I got hired uh, in the art department on episode two for a few weeks, and that started the next phase of my time at ILM. And I considered the bravest person in that equation was my wife at the time, to trust me to do that. Um, but again, like, don't make the mistake of looking at anybody successful from the outside and thinking of their path as linear. If your, pa your path feels like triage, right? Like, I'm just trying to patch together what's going so this car gets to the next thing. Everyone feels that way. Nobody escapes that. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Hello, fireman. Hi, my name is Nick. I'm from Ben Salem, Pennsylvania, stagehand, firefighter, and audio engineer. To you have one of my favorite tools in your hand. I do. Yes. So tomorrow night, I'm hosting a panel called Why We Make. I want to know what your best advice is to inspire others to get involved in creative processes, whatever their art form may be. Uh, why we make? We make because we are explorers. Humans are driven to explore their surroundings. Every generation since we've been sitting around campfires has sent its best and its brightest to the edge of the known to report back. And we explore outwards and we also explore inwards. Uh, and when a person who has not made something thinks about it long enough to have a point of view and uses their hands to make a thing that they thought of, that fit their point of view, something really magical happens at that moment. Like the world cracks open. And that is a worthwhile feeling to chase because I think it's a central human thing to like take that point of view and follow it, follow the rabbit down the rabbit hole and see where it leads. I'm still not sure where my journey is leading. I mean, I was asked about my future plans. I have some future plans, but everything could change next week. I don't know. But it is a really important thing also to make something that's yours from your own point of view. And it's funny that um, I spend so much of my time replicating other people's IP. And yet I also learned that within that, I have a really specific point of view. It took me a long time to discover that I want a specific experience with the prop that I'm making, or I end up having a different design aesthetic than the original, and so I modify it. But every one of those things teaches me about the way that I think and about the way that I approach the world. And that's really useful. I, I, I really would have loved to finish this with some sort of rhetorical flourish that everyone got excited about, but I just don't have it. But thank you for that awesome question. Thank you. Wait, come here, bring this tool up here. This tool is called a pro bar, and it is like a crowbar for zombie killing. This is a beautiful fake one, I love you. Um, but yeah, I have one, and it's, this is a stolid steel spike on the one that I have. Yes! <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Uh, hi, Adam. I'm also Adam. Hello, Adam. <laughs> I'm from Columbia, Maryland. And like many other people here, when the pandemic hit, you know, all my plans changed and I got stuck in a part-time job that I hate. And I suffer from really bad anxiety. So I turned to the same thing that I turned to when I was a kid, and that was you. <laughs> so, well, back when I was a kid, I watched every single episode of Mythbusters. I hope you didn't burn down anything too expensive. <laughs> But so, on to my question. This is the first time that I have ever made a cosplay, mm -hmm. and I only did it because you inspired me to. I'm hugging you from here now. I, so, I learned how to make my cosplay from your videos, <laughs> but the thing I never really got was, how do you get in the mind of your character? How do you, like, get into the performance of it? Um, 
I start with the pose. I start with the photo. I start with the photo that I want. So usually with every costume, there's a photo that I'm excited about. There's some, yeah, you might not realize it at the beginning, but you know how like you're combing through the restaurant menu and you eventually stop on the thing your eye stops on three times? So I look at all the photos I've been using for reference, and I know there's like a couple that I really like where Cap is standing like this. And I think, okay, that's, maybe I can pull that one off. <laughs> um, and then I have a full-size mirror, and I set it up, and I try and get that pose right. And frankly, there's so much that comes out of just putting your body into the pose. Um, <laughs> no? Um, just putting your body into the pose is so powerful. I would submit, oh my gosh, how amazing, how amazing is Tom Hiddleston and his ability to like, that guy is always like pushing his boobs out, <laughs> pulling his shoulders back, looking magnificent and committing 100% to the absurdity of Loki. And only that commitment makes that role work so well, right? Um, and it's about being not shameless, but embarrassmentless. Like my, you know, I'll check a pose with my wife, and frankly, she's not in, she's not a cosplayer, but she really loves me and she supports me. So she'll tell me when something's working. She'll help me figure out which kind of gun show I'd like to show with this costume. <laughs> And it's a process, but that's where it begins. It begins with that. And then, frankly, when you start to like, move in the costume, you go to a con floor and you're moving in the costume, someone asks to take a photo and you go into the pose, and then you're off to the races. Then it's really, really fun. Um, my first real experience with that was the third cosplay I did was the Joker from Dark Knight from the bank heist. And so I was wearing this mask and I was walking like the Heath, I can't do it now, I'm not gonna do it great, but like I really practiced that way in which he sort of led with his head like a snake. Um, and I scared some children. <laughs> I'd like to think that it was good for them. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Hey, how's it going? Um... Very good. My name is Vernon from uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, just real quick, I wanted to say, you know, you're awesome. Um, you know, I always see you like making stuff and it look like magic. It's just like, that's cool, you know? I, I can't do that, but you know, I do appreciate when you do it. But, Thank you. Uh, my question is, whenever you're dealing with a project that you're having like real trouble with, like you just can't seem to get to that next step, what are some of the techniques or sort of uh, head spaces you try to get into in order to tackle the problem in a different way? Um, that's a wonderful question. Um, whenever I'm in that kind of headspace, um, there's always something to do on the project. It doesn't matter if there's a specific problem kicking my ass right now. If there is and I can't look at it anymore, there's still something I can be doing with this. I can go work on the electrics for a while. I can go make some other part. Sometimes on a build, I'll, I'll know there'll be like three fun things to do and I'll just hold those back until the moment when it's getting really dark and I want something to build my momentum. I think of my creativity as a momentum machine and I'm always trying to figure out ways to keep it up, right? And you know, sometimes one bad Zoom call can ruin me for an hour or two. Sure, you know, I'm like anybody else. And uh, when that happens, sometimes I'll, I'll leave the shop. I've learned that in this last year to just walk out of the shop and go home. Um, and give myself some space. It's funny, I was talking to a friend yesterday who's an editor and he was saying, yeah, I do a lot of procrastinating when I'm editing. And I was like, really? And he's like, yeah, I'll be editing for like two hours and then I'll be like, ah, and I'll go over here and I'll, I'll roll out some pasta dough and I'll hand cut some pasta <laughs> and then I'll go back to editing. And I'm like, you think that's procrastinating? Because I think that's a creative process. I think you are going back and forth between two things because they keep you in this state. And he was like, oh, I never thought of it like that. I'm like, yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I tend to start projects by looking at the most difficult problem to solve and working hard on that one. And that one's gonna kick my butt through the whole build usually. But because I've started early, then I get to kind of, when those milestones happen to kick my butt, I can pull out something fun and do it and keep my momentum going. Thank you. Such a great question. Thank you, man. Hello. Hi. Uh, my name is Julia. I'm from New York. Uh, 
and I'm a little bit flustered because I forget his name, but that was literally the question that I had. Uh, well, then you're welcome. Great question. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So this one I'm just basically pulling out on the fly, which is I know the day isn't over, and I know it's not been very long, but what is like your best moment um, today at AwesomeCon? Today at AwesomeCon? A person came up to my table and said, I have a present for you. And what he gave me was an 1855 pocket sextant, a, naviga a piece of brass navigation equipment. And I was like, I've bought the cheap Amazon versions of these only to be like super disappointed and they're barely steampunkery. Um, and I looked at this and I was like, wow, these etchings are really tight. This thing is really original. It is a genuinely beautiful piece of equipment that like, I will enjoy staring at for hours later on today. Um, I really appreciate that they gave me hours of future excitement crawling over <laughs> the brass works of an ancient piece of navigation equipment. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> now I'm thinking that I'm an asshole because like, my favorite moment was when someone gave me something really cool. <laughs> Sorry, and I don't mean to curse. If there's children in the audience, you just need to know that when adults curse, it's super cool. <laughs> and that when kids curse, it's just gross. <laughs> really, save your cursing for your peers. Hi, my name's April. I uh, live in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, and kind of the same thing happened. Where? <laughs> exact same thing. Bam, bam. So I guess... My new question is, on the fly, is that when it comes to tabletop RPGs, what's been the most influential to you, and what's been your favorite over your span of just gaming and such? Oh my goodness, I will tell you I am not an avid RPG really? player. No, I know. I wouldn't expect. Okay. I know. I, it just, it hasn't shown up in my friend group. Okay. I, look, if I lived in the same city as Will Wheaton, I'm sure. <laughs> Fisher guy from D&D, &D, honestly, so. Well, so I do, uh, I was asked in 1984, I was a junior in high school, and I was, I was, um, I was a page uh, at the local library in Tarrytown, New York, at Warner, Warner Library. And they were like, hey, there's this new thing called Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> Maybe you should DM a summer session of D&D. &D. And I true. don't remember much about my dungeon, Except that on the first day, this really improbably attractive girl who was my age joined the session and she stayed through all the summer. And then at the end of the summer, no, not at the end of the summer, that six months later, December of that year, I actually think it was 1983 because I was a sophomore now that I'm remembering, <laughs> she called me randomly and my mom was like, Honey, there's someone on the phone, and it's a girl for you? <laughs> and I was like, I was just as surprised. Hello? And she was like, I've been trying. I've called all the savages to find you. And I was like, what? And she was like, I just thought you were really cool, and I was wondering if you wanted to hang out. And I was like, ah! <laughs> And she was like, how do we hang out? And we're like 15, right? We don't know. And I'm like, my parents are having a Christmas party. <laughs> You should come over. So she came over to the Christmas party with her mom. And my mom, bless her, like grabbed her mom. She was like, let me show you the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> and so then she and I'm like showing her around the house, giving the tour. I don't know what to do. I don't know how it's supposed to go. This is my room. Yes, those are all my Legos. <laughs> yes, I was working on them today. I hope that's not a deal breaker. <laughs> and then we hear her mom and my mom downstairs and we know that the time is, is almost done and so we stand, we're staring at each other and you know, that's all I can hear is <laughs> And she leans towards me and smashes her face into mine and puts her tongue into my mouth. <laughs> like, it is such a weird feeling the first time it happens. Especially with someone who is like trying to clean out the inside of my mouth with their tongue. Part of me is like, this is really weird. And another part of me is like, this is so awesome. <laughs> so, yes, 
my first kiss came about because of Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank man. you. Oh, my name is Steven. I am from Winchester, Virginia, and I was wondering, for cosplaying, what is your favorite base material to build from? Ooh. Um, you know, that really changes all the time. I'm really loving Sintra right now, foam PVC or Sinex. Um, I really dig that stuff. I also have been using a lot of Coroplast, which is the, uh, uh, the what do you call that stuff? Twin wall. It's like what they make cardboard signs out of, that, I don't know. Twin wall, polycarbonate, uh, uh, the foam PVC, I really like because of how fast it is. Like, Weta taught me how quickly you can make props out of three-quarter inch thick PVC. You don't even need to make any dimension to it, just like a router and a couple of band saws and you can make a really amazing sword. Um, it's expensive, I mean, at that level, but you know, it's, it, it, the speed is really incredible. Um, I just did a build with a lot of fiberglass and that was lovely, though itchy. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I've been doing more textile stuff. And by textile stuff, I mean, I'm doing some of the sewing, but I'm hiring really great people to do most of the sewing. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a constantly moving target. I, I don't have a, um, okay, well, actually that's not necessarily true. Everything begins with foam core. Yeah, I buy foam core constantly because I do architectural models, but I also do hand models. I love to figure out sizes of things by building it multiple times. Yeah, I, I'm gonna go with foam core. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hello. I'm Adam from Charlottesville, Virginia. <laughs> A third Adam. Improbable as it is. Um, your videos were some of the highlights for my time at work over the last year. And my favorite video you made was when you modeled your house. I'm curious if there are other buildings you'd be interested in doing something similar with. Oh. Yes. I love architectural models. I'm, I've always been obsessed with them. There's a process of making houses that I live in or have lived in with an architectural model that feels like a really interesting kind of recapitulation. Um, and I started doing this when I bought my first house back in 2003 or four. Um, I just wanted to understand the house and I know how I think, so I just built it in foam core and I was like, oh wow, I found where the HVAC goes from downstairs to upstairs. <laughs> I now know where, the, I learned all this really interesting stuff doing that. Um, and I kept on doing it. I am really, but this leads to a different passion which is at some point in the future I will do an extensive ship model, specifically like a Napoleonic era ship model, ship of the line probably the surprise from the Patrick O'Brien novels. But for me, it's not just the ship model, I wanna do a cutaway. Cause I love looking at the inside of things. I mean, that shot from um, The Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou when they show the whole submarine on its side and everyone's working. I love that shot so much. Actually, I love and I hate that shot at the same time. Mm -hmm. I love that shot because it is so beautiful and evocative. What drives me crazy about that shot is they built that set practically just like that. And that strikes me as like a huge waste of money <laughs> just to be able to say, we built that just like that. Because all you need to do is build one set for each room and cobble them together in CG. Like, like that is absolutely, no one's ever gonna notice the difference between those two things, I swear. So it drives me a little crazy that they did it for real, but I love the shot. Thank, Thank you. you. Now don't anybody be going telling Wes Anderson that I crapped on one of the shots from his movie. It's between us. I'm Sabrina and I'm from Woodbridge, Virginia. And I just want to say thank you for the many years of, edu of entertainment and education. Um, the last few years of my dad's life, he died of Alzheimer's. Uh, we I'm actually sorry. had family, um, family watch nights of, you know, oh. myth musters uh, with my son, my mom, my dad. So just want to say thank you for some great memories. And my question is, which... Thank you. I lost, my dad too died of Alzheimer's after seven years. It was very rough. It is, it is an, an evil disease I would not wish on my worst enemy. Same. Um, but my question is, which of, the, um, which of the things that you did on Mythbusters was the hardest sell to the producers? Because y'all did some um, pretty crazy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and you already have said there's things like, no, you cannot do that, guys. But which one were you able to sell them on? 
Yeah, well, the first really amazing thing that we sold them on was the episode about a Civil War soldier who supposedly <coughs> got shot through one of his testicles <laughs> and said bullet landed a few hundred feet away in the womb of a young woman and supposedly impregnated her. <laughs> the episode's title, Son of a Gun. <laughs> yeah. As Tom Waits, Tom Waits has told this story uh, in concert and he's like, it's not for everybody. <laughs> so we wanted to, so we pitched this to Discovery and they were like, okay. We're gonna lay down some rules. <laughs> you can only use the phrase genetic legacy for the substance you will be testing with. And we were like, fair enough. <laughs> so we do the episode and it airs and uh, Gina McCarthy was the head of Discovery at that time and I, she was our producer. Uh, when you have a TV show, you have your own producer on the show, but there's always a network producer that oversees and minds the show and kind of keeps it rolling along. And Gina McCarthy was that for us at Discovery. She was one of my favorites that ever did it. And she was like, she called us up and she was like, I gotta tell you, we didn't think you guys were gonna be able to pull that episode off in a family-friendly way, and you did. So is there something else? <laughs> and we were like, well, yes, we would like to do an entire episode about farts, please. And they were like, sure, but we're gonna have to lay down some rules. <laughs> For instance, we weren't allowed to say fart. Even though it's not one of the seven words, it's adjacent. And so, and they wouldn't let me say my second favorite, which is Chanel number two. Can't imagine why. Yeah. <laughs> However, I do believe Jackass included that I am the first human to light their fart on national television. So, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, in, in point of fact, I will say that Discovery was always a great partner. The we, once we'd done those two episodes, the weirder it was, the more they were willing to sign a check. Yes. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Bex. I'm a rising college freshman uh, from Virginia. Um, I've been watching you basically since before I was born. I have stories of my dad like putting it on when I was an infant and he kept just putting it on as I got older to the point where I'm 18 right now and last night I was showing him Simone Gertz who I found through you. I was showing the Prad Parent video. Oh, oh that's so great. I love that video. Um, but I'm a, I'm a very like creative person. I'm, I, I draw and I animate and I, I sew. I work with my hands a lot. And I get into these moments where I have an itch, where I'm like, I want to work with my hands really bad, but I don't have the resources or I don't have the time. Yeah. So how do you deal with that? I draw. More and more and more I draw. I don't draw enough. I've been drawing a lot lately because I'm traveling a lot, and that's a thing that I do on planes. But drawing really does wake up those parts of my brain for problem solving. And I have found, uh, and I've always, I've, I hated my line. I hated the lines that I drew until about six years ago. And, and at a certain point, I had just drawn enough that the lines started behaving and the lines started making sense to me. And then, like, the, learning the 88 keys as a piano player, I started to be able to see things I could do. And I'm still learning, I'm still iterating, but absolutely, I was in the green room just half an hour ago drawing out plans for this build I'm gonna do next week. And I was doing significant amounts of mechanical problem solving with a pencil. And that's thrilling and that makes me, that stops my hands from sweating. Good luck. Thank you so much. I wanna be like you when I grow up. Stay good. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. I wanna be like you when I grow up. <laughs> And I just turned 69. <laughs> so first of all, someone asked you what was your favorite uh, Mythbuster episode. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you my favorite. Please. Every episode I watched. <laughs> Aww. Aww. Now, I had to do. I'm, I'm a griot, an educator, and a mentor. And some of the younger kids that I was mentoring, they looked at you. They looked at me. 
And they said, Baba C, you're crazy. <laughs> but he's crazy. <laughs> you do on Mythbusters, or you did on Mythbusters, what I do with stories, and what I do mentoring. So I'm from Washington, DC, and I cuss you forever. <laughs> Washingtonians get that. Got it. Okay, so I mentor. And I saw you, I thought, it can't get any better than what he's been doing. And then you did Mythbusters Jr. Right. <sighs> yeah. I was blown away. I mentor. Yeah. And the work you did with those kids, I can call them kids, I'm 69, was incredible. So my question to you is, are you ever going to do another Mythbuster Jr.? And if not, are you open to working with those beautiful, wonderful young creators again? Oh, 100%. Those, those six kids that made up Mythbusters Jr. are my heroes. And one of my favorite moments of making that show was the first time we flew them all out. We flew them all out about four weeks before we started real production. And we just flew them out to kind of see the set, and they didn't know they were going to meet me. So they were assembled in the soundstage, and then I came out. And I said, uh, I welcomed them, and I told them they were my colleagues. Yes. And I just got goosebumps all yes. up my arm. When I told them that, but more than me telling them that, when I watched it land in their faces, that that was our approach. You're, I'm, not here to, I'm here to do this with you. And our axiom on that show was, if these kids have the best summer ever, we're going to get a great TV show out of it. Yes. That was the only goal we had. They had to have a blast doing what they were doing, and they really did. As for whether or not there will be more episodes of Mythbusters Jr., that is a discovery decision. It's above my pay grade, and I would love to make more. I have no idea if there will be more. And but, just, just one little thing. Yeah. Never lose the intrinsic child that lives within you. <laughs> Agreed. A hundred percent. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, the thing that I love that you said, too, is that you tell them stories. And I said earlier that it's, a, it's the human condition to explore, but I forgot that the other half of that is to come back and tell each other stories about what we've experienced. Storytelling is also this, I mean, it's evolutionary in us to tell our stories and to understand where we've been and to realize that we're all standing on the shoulders of giants. And when you tell a story, when you, when you make a, an educational tale a story, it goes in. If you just tell them it's a bunch of facts to memorize by Tuesday, that's not going to go anywhere. That's not going to lead to problem-solving abilities. But when you tell the story that, like, oh, a, a glacier is a river on quaaludes. <laughs> <laughs> That has a physical aspect to it that you put in your body, and that's a beautiful feeling. Thank you so much. Uh, and, uh, I'm yeah. going to leave, but you prove something that I tell my kids all the time. If you hang around me, you're going to have a good time, but if you're not careful, you just might learn something new. Bingo. And we did. <laughs> Asante Sama. Thank you, man. A pleasure. Now, I am out of time, but I'm wondering if there are any young kids in either line who's been waiting and wants to ask a question. Come on up, young, young person. Thank you so much for accommodating them. Young man, what is your question? Um, so I was asking, um, what was your, your and Jamie's first thoughts slash um, ideas to come up with Mythbusters? So we did not come up with the idea for the show. We were hired talent. And the original structure of the show was very weird. And I'm just going to go about four or five minutes over here. I hope that's okay, everybody. Is that okay? Oh, he doesn't know. <laughs> um, our first thoughts were, the title Mythbusters is a little weird. We really seriously thought that. And then we were both fans of the Darwin Awards, so we worked out how to do Lawn Chair Larry. <laughs> we, worked, we physically worked it out, and we filmed that, and we sent that to Discovery. That is the sum to, we spent, we spent 10 minutes on the phone, Jamie calling me up going, oh, Discovery Channel just said they want a demo reel for a show, and I, I don't really think I could <laughs> host a show on my own, but maybe we could do it together. I'd been teaching myself digital filmmaking that spring. I brought a camera over. I edited a 14-minute piece out of the three hours of footage we shot, and the camera crew showed up three weeks later, and we... That was the spring of 2002. 
we didn't stop production until December of 2015. It was such a crazy ride. We didn't have time to think. I started to think about what it was like to have a TV show in the middle of the first season. <laughs> That's when I started to be like, okay, what is this job? Let's, get to, let's wrap our heads around it. Um, I must go, but thank you so much for your excellent question, young man. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for having me. Thanks for your warmth. Thanks for taking care of each other. Thanks for cosplaying. And mwah, I love you, and I'll see you next year. Adam Savage, everybody. Hi, this is Michael Shanks, and you're watching Fandom Spotlight. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. The fate of the universe may depend on it. And have fun, and follow your fandom.